Okay. I'm going to start with the fact that Homer Simpson is one of the most brilliant mathematicians of our time. On On September 20th, 1998, Homer Simpson, in the episode The Wizard of Evergreen Terrace, managed to disprove a conjunction that has been without proof for 358 years. Let's examine this for a second. 3,987 to the power of 12 plus 4,365 to the power of 12 equals 4,472 to the power of 12. I'm going to have to use my calculator for this. And as we can see, it comes to the same number. It's 6.397665634 times 10 to the power of 43. We'll get back to that soon. <laughs> but first, let's talk about theory versus theorem. The basis of science, science. is empiricism. The ability, applying, sorry, applying the result of observation to real life. A scientific theory becomes mutually acceptable until a better theory is proposed, based on better observations. In mathematics, a theorem needs to be totally true. In that, mathematics is much more akin to philosophy. We start with some axioms, which are evident truths, and using those plus logic, we create absolute truths that are based on this. Let's take a look at the Pythagorean theorem. On a straight triangle, a square of A plus the square of B would equal the square of C. So we have this triangle. Let's create three more and create the square that the triangles insert inside. Wow. The red area is still the same that it was, which basically proves the Pythagorean theorem. The whole number solutions to the theorem are known as Pythagorean triples. For instance, 2, 3, and 5, 5, 12, and 13, or 8, 15, and 17. And there are 16 primitive solutions. Primitive meaning that they're not a function of each other, like not 4, 6, and 10. There, there are 16 solutions to this equation under 100. There are 31 more between 100 and 300. And there's basically an infinite number of these solutions. Pythagorean triples were known as far back as 4,000 years ago in Egypt, and we have written proof that they were also known in ancient Babylon in about 1700 BC, in India in 600, in China in 200 BC, all of those independently discovered. The first written proof that we know is attributed to Pythagoras, and it appears in Euclid's book, Pythagoras, and it appears in Euclid's book, Elements. Written circa 300 BC, this book was one of the main sources of ancient Greek math during the Byzantine period and later. Translations were made from Greek to Latin in 500 AD and to Arabic in 800 AD, and it was lost in Western Europe and was introduced as a translation back from Arabic in 1120 by the English monk Adlerd of Bath. This photo comes from a copy that was found in the Vatican and was dated 900 AD, and we can see that it basically talks about the squares on a triangle. And it came from Constantinople. Why Constantinople? Because as the Roman Empire breaks down, Rome itself gets sacked multiple times, the first of them in 410 AD. Europe falls into the dark ages of scientific stagnation and remains retarded until the 14th century, roughly. Scientific progress moves east to Byzantium and the Arab empires. But Renaissance shows up. The printing press is invented and mathematics is once again popular in I Western Europe. So. And we'll quickly jump to this person, <laughs> Pierre de Fermat. Born in 1607 in France to a family of a wealthy leather merchant, Fermat receives a classical education and goes to law school. Upon graduation, he buys a position at the Toulouse Parliament as an adjudicator, sort of a judge, and adds the noble debt to his name. Fermat dies in 1665 at the age of 57. He hasn't published anything related to mathematics during his lifetime. After his death, his son Samuel comes to tidy up the house and finds troves of paper with mathematical notes and correspondence. In those letters and notes, Fermat would express ideas but provide no proof for those ideas, leaving the proving to other people as kind of a challenge. In his correspondence with Blaise Pascal, for instance, they mutually laid the groundwork for a theory of probability and some of his other work might have served as base for Newton and Leibniz independently establishing calculus. One of the main things that Samuel finds is a copy of this book, Arithmetica by Diophantus, with notes written on the margin of the book. Samuel edits the notes 
and in 67 he releases this version of Arithmetica with his father comments. The book deals mostly with quadratic equations, divided originally into 13 volumes with 10 problems in each volume. Only six of the volumes survived to Fermat's days. On the, main, on the margin of volume two, problem eight, Fermat writes the following. Cubum autem in duos cubos, aut quadro quadratum in duos quadro quadratum, a general null, uh, wait, you don't speak Latin? Okay, let's translate it to English. It is impossible to separate a cube into two cubes, or a fourth power into two fourth powers, or a general, any power higher than the second, into two like powers. I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. <laughs> In other words, Fermat says that to the power of n plus b, a to the power of n plus b to the power of n equals c to the power of n is false to any natural value when the n is larger than two. And thus the Fermat conjecture is born wrongly named Fermat's last theorem because it was not proven, only a theorem. It becomes a theorem once it's proven, but this, we have no proof. So he didn't quite provide the proof, but he does provide us the proof for n plus four, which when factorized also makes a correctness for all non-odd primes. This leaves us with an infinitely smaller group to analyze, only the primes. So first we're trying to get all the numbers, now, which is an infinite set. Now we have a smaller, still infinite set of all the non-odd primes. The only odd prime actually being is number two. The first person to try and take a stab at this conjecture was Leonid Euler. 17th century Swiss mathematician, Euler manages to prove n equals three is false, using much of the same techniques as Fermat. But he fails to advance anywhere past this problem. Next up in 1825 were the French mathematicians Legendre and German Dirichte, who separately proved that n equals five has no solutions. Next one to actually manage to make a bigger stab at this is Sophie Germain, the French woman, and we need to talk about her a little bit more. Born in the late 17th century, Germain was 13 when the French Revolution erupted. Her parents locked her up at home to protect her from the violence, so she started exploring her father's library. Becoming fascinated with mathematics, she also taught herself Latin and Greek in order to be able to read works by Newton and Euler. When she was 18, the École Polytechnique opened, but she couldn't apply due to her sex. On the other hand, they call made the lecture notes available, sorry, eh, longer text. Uh, the Ecole Polytechnique made the notes available to everybody, so sort of like correspondence degree. Um, she asked and received the notes, but they required her to submit written observations. She managed to get a name of a student who stopped attending and used his name. So she became sending her notes to Joseph Louis Lagrange, who suddenly noticed an unexplainable jump in the level and the quality of the notes from this student, who wasn't all that good before, uh, and we requested a meeting. Fortunately, Lagrange didn't mind that Germaine wasn't Monsieur Le Blanc and that she was a woman and became her mentor. Germaine made some serious progress on the conjecture and proved it for all odd primes smaller than 270. Her work also significantly advanced the study of prime numbers, and she would later serve as a base for Turing's work on encryption, but that's a totally different story that somebody either told or should tell later. Back to Fermat's last conjecture. During the 19th century, many mathematicians tried and failed to tackle the problem, motivated primarily by the ever-growing fame of the problem, partially because they were offered rewards by the French Academy of Scientists. Gabriel Lemay tried to prove n equals seven, but failed to get anywhere further. Ernst Kummer proved for all regular primes, but fair to prove the rest. There's about 39% of primes that are not regular. Carl Friedrich Gauss, the German, also tried and failed. And more and more and more. The next name we need to mention here, who didn't quite try to solve the conjecture on his own, is Paul Wolfskell, a physician and a heir to a banking family from German. There are 70, several stories as to how the prize was established. He basically established a prize to, for whoever can solve this. Um, one of the stories says about, uh, he set a date for suicide, feeling that his life is over and done with. And then on the night before, he ran into Fermat's last conjecture in a library and got so engrossed into reading about it that he basically missed his deadline and thus was saved. <laughs> Other sources say that he just didn't want to leave anything to his wife. In any case, in 1908, Wolfskell bequests 100,000 gold marks to the person that will provide a solution and set the Göttingen Academy of Sciences to administer the process. You actually needed to provide a peer-reviewed document in order to get the prize. 
and get there. So here we are, 300-something years after the creation of this conjecture, and no solution is seen on the horizon. Problems seep into popular culture. Um, there is a, sto a story that is published in 1954 by Arthur Porges, where a bargain with the devil is made null, since the devil cannot provide the answer to Fermat's last conjecture. Um, the devil says, basically, if you can ask me a question I cannot answer, you'll get your soul back. And when the question is asked, he asks for 24 hours, goes around the entire galaxy, comes back with nothing. There we go. Fermat's last theorem. You're familiar with it? Vaguely. X to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, where n is greater than 2. There was no proof included. Mm -hmm. And for 800 years, people have been trying to solve it, including you. I find it stimulating. <laughs> what the writers and Picard didn't know is that this person, Andrew Wiles, was already almost there. This episode was broadcast in 1989, by the way. Born in 1953 in Cambridge, England, Wiles became obsessed with the Fermat conjecture when he first saw it in his school library at the age of 10. He was fascinated by the fact that the conjecture was so easy to state that even a 10-year-old could understand, but that no one has yet to manage to prove it. He proceeded to study mathematics, earning his PhD from Oxford in 1980 and becoming a professor of mathematics in Princeton. In 1987, shrouded by total secrecy, Wiles withdraws into his study and starts to work on the Fermat theorem using research that was done in Japan in the 50s and 60s and in Britain, the US, and Germany in the 80s. Without going into too many mathematical details because, frankly, I don't understand them myself well enough, and word is that less than 50 people in the entire world today fully understand the proof that he provided. Wells understands that he needs to connect the Fermat conjecture to elliptic curves and model forms to areas that were unconnected before. Uh, a conjecture that was worked in Japan called Tanayuma Shimara was part of it. And he, he understood that if he proves that conjecture, he can also prove the Fermat theorem. So in June 21st, uh, 1995, in Cambridge, in the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences, uh, there was a workshop for mathematicians, and Wiles introduces a three-day seminar during that workshop named Elliptic Curves and Modular Forms, where on the first day he starts expa explaining some basic stuff, on the second day he gets closer, and by the end of the third day, when the board is scribbled with a lot of math, he just goes and writes x to the power of n plus y to the power of n equals z to the power of n, and says, I think I'll be done here. <laughs> That's the next day. New York Times, and if you look up there, they basically, he basically solved. He then submitted it to peer review, and oh my God, they found a lapse. Yeah, his entire research was very good at advanced mathematics innumerably, but they found a problem. And so he went back home and for about eight months was trying to find, and eventually did find, the solution to that. Yep, so the paper got submitted in 1995. Um, he did get the Wolfsburg Prize, which at that point was only worth about $20,000 because the inflation in Germany during the post-World War I period just, yeah, brought it to nothing. You don't need to worry about him for money because he also won the Abel Prize, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Mathematics. Since Nobel never established a prize for mathematics, the German government went and established one so he won that in, I believe, 2005. But let's get back for a second to that problem we had with Homer Simpson. He, he actually managed to prove that it's wrong, so how do we have a proof? Let's turn our calculators 90 degrees. And we can see that after the first 10 digits, the numbers are different. Yeah. So for the end, I'd like to raise a toast for all 10-year-old children that have the audacity to dream that solving a 350-something-year problem is in their power. <laughs>